Okay. We're just getting started with our second panel. I hope you were able to tune in for that that first panel, which was absolutely fantastic and a great way to kick off our equity summit. We're now moving under panel number two, which is understanding the barriers for postdocs with disabilities. And in this session, we're going to look at the range of obstacles and inequities that individuals with disabilities face as they serve as postdocs or they're entering their academic positions. And we'll consider barriers to obtaining positions and discuss strategies that colleagues, mentors, department chairs, institutional leaders, and people with disabilities themselves can use to thrive in them. And I'm happy to introduce our moderator for today, uh, Dr. Logan Jin, who is the Assistant Director for STEM at Brown University, where he works on initiatives related to STEM graduate student and postdoc teaching professional development. Prior to arriving at Brown, uh, he was an NSF Graduate Research Fellow at ASU, Arizona State University. He holds a PhD in biology from ASU, where his dissertation work centered around the experiences of STEM students with disabilities. He also has a BS in biology and a BA in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So two Chapel Hill folks in, in a row and two panels. Logan, turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Tom. And I'm honored to, to be here. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to session two of the NPA Equity Summit. Um, I'll serve as today's moderator. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we're going to begin. I'll introduce our uh, two lovely panelists. Um, and then we uh, they will share a short narrative um, about their experience um, navigating um, their academic positions. Um, and then we will uh, open it up to a discussion and Q&A. Um, with that being said, um, I just want to uh, share a reminder that uh, we ask participants to be muted with their cameras off during the session. Um, but utilize the Q&A function to ask questions. Um, this will allow um, us to, to filter through questions and hopefully be able to uh, have your questions answered throughout the session. Um, also, I want to touch on that uh, the Equity Summit often uh, discusses sensitive topics, um, and we just uh, want to share a reminder um, to not hesitate to reach out to your postdoc offices or appropriate offices on your campus um, should you um, have questions and, and take advantage of those resources. Um, also, the session will be recorded and be available um, soon on the on the MPA website um, if you would like to come back and watch. Um, so with that being said, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's session. Um, I'm joined by both Dr. Bonnie Sweener and Dr. Rupa Valdez. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Sweener is an epidemiologist and endowed professor of disability health and justice at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing with joint appointments at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bonnie is the founder and director of Johns Hopkins Disability Health Research Center, which uses data-driven approaches to shift the paradigm from living with a disability to thriving with a disability. She's motivated by her personal experiences with a disability, where her work focuses on advancing equity for people with disabilities, promoting disability inclusion, accessibility, and developing evidence-based and disability-inclusive policies. Also, we're also joined by Dr. Rupa Valdez. Dr. Valdez is a professor at the University of Virginia with appointments in the School of Engineering and Applied Science and the School of Medicine. Dr. Valdez merges the human, the disciplines of human factor, health informatics, cultural anthropology, and community engagement to understand and support uh, health disparity populations, including communities of color, rural communities, and disability community. Her work has been supported by a AHRQ, NIH, NSF, and USDA, and other private foundations. Dr. Valdez serves on multiple boards, including the American Association of People with Disabilities and co-president, founder and co-president of, uh, of the Blue Trunk Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to accessible travel. She's also testified before Congress and has served in a number of advisory capacities, including NCQA, NASEM, PCORI, and AHRQ and others. Um, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, both Dr. Sweener and Dr. Valdez. And I think we'll begin with Dr. Uh, Sweener providing um, a short narrative. Thanks, Logan. This is Bonnie. Um, also, just start with my uh, visual description. I'm a, a middle-aged uh, white woman in my later 40s <laughs> with shoulder length, longer than shoulder length, blonde hair. Uh, I have a 
dark blue top on and um, I'm in my home office today. I'm grateful for that on a Friday. Um, so Rupa and I had discussed sharing a little bit about our personal experiences before going into the, the conversation with Logan, as Logan described. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, my experience with disability began right at the beginning of uh, my graduate training. I have a visual disability and um, right as I was applying to graduate programs to Masters of Public Health programs, my vision loss unexpectedly began um, and was, uh, I had a, a pretty rapid loss of, of vision in the beginning and continued to lose vision over time. I have a degenerative retinal condition. Um, but at the time it was a challenge for so many reasons because I had no community as was previously discussed on the last panel. Um, my understanding of disability was entrenched in all the stereotypes. And so I really felt like I was not gonna be able to, <clears throat> to pursue my career as a scientist, as a researcher. And a lot of that was um, informed by uh, the lack of, of individuals with disabilities, people who are blind um, working in academia or in research. And so I assumed I couldn't do that either. Obviously that wasn't the case, but it certainly has been a very long and, and winding road but you know, similar to what was described in the prior panel, I went through my graduate training and my postdoc without really understanding or knowing how to get accommodations. It was a new experience to me. I had to figure out how to advocate. I didn't do it well in the beginning. And I was honestly pretty ashamed of um, my disability. I was very afraid at that time that people wouldn't wanna hire me, wouldn't wanna work with me. And I'll be honest, some of that was true. And some of that continues to be true, unfortunately. Um, and uh, so I, I did, I spent a lot of time and energy just trying to hide what I could until I couldn't do that any longer. Um, and that has really shaped, you know, the work I do and the advocacy work I, I participate in in trying to change the way we're thinking about disability as a society and including people with disabilities in higher education and STEM and in, in research. Um, and I've learned a lot along the way and hopefully in this conversation we'll share some of that, but I also don't wanna to pretend to have all of the answers. And so I'm just really grateful to this conversation and this uh, collective action to, to continue the pushback. Great, thank you, Bonnie, for for sharing that. Um, and then, yeah, I'm really interested in in learning more and, and hearing more in our discussion. Um, Rupa, would you like to share your uh, your narrative now? Yeah, I'm happy to, and happy to be here with all of you today. Um, so I use she her pronouns, and I will also start with my visual description. So I am a South Asian woman with um, brown skin and a long black hair. I'm wearing a black top, and I'm. I think it's some of you may have heard in my office um, on campus, and I apologize if you're going to hear any background noise. I was telling everyone where I joined, there's some construction happening outside my window that had some unfortunate timing. Um, Bonnie, I think you and I actually share some parts of our journey that I didn't realize in terms of when we acquired our disabilities. I first became actually chronically ill when I was a sophomore in college, and it took several years to get diagnoses. And I would say at that time, I mostly just tried to figure things out on my own. I didn't have a sense of community around being chronically ill. I, I wouldn't have even been able to probably put that label on kind of what that experience was like for me. Um, it did mean I was studying abroad when this happened and it meant I came home early, earlier than I had wanted to. And part of it was to try to get some answers about what was happening to my body. And then I would say that, you know, as I got some answers and kind of learned how to navigate being in college with that, it shaped um, my decision of what to do after college in, in the sense that I felt maybe Bonnie a little bit like you're saying, I wasn't sure how much I would be able to do kind of out in the world and wanted to take some time to figure that out and also just figure out what I wanted to do as a 23 year old. 
And I decided to go to graduate school. I ended up working for a faculty member as a part-time research assistant, trying to understand if I wanted to do research. And that faculty member was really supportive of letting me create my own work schedule and kind of show up when I could show up and was encouraged me to think about graduate school, which I did. And so graduate school at the beginning, I would say, went fairly smoothly in terms of having the support I needed. I'd stayed at the same institution um, with faculty who had known me as an undergrad, and that, I think, facilitated some of my ability to communicate transparently about what I needed and um, get the support that I needed. And then I developed another condition in my late 20s, um, and that it was called enthesopathy. So it's like widespread tendon damage throughout my body that um, took a long time to figure out kind of how that developed and everything. But anyway, it's, uh, it's side effects from medications I took in my 20s. But it meant that I pretty quickly after my daughter was, she was a year old at the time, I was trying to finish up my dissertation. Um, I pretty quickly went to starting to use a wheelchair, not being able to type, um, having to do everything by dictation. And again, just feeling like everything in my world had shifted, um, both kind of as a new mom and trying to navigate having a really young kid who I, I couldn't really engage with physically in ways that I had imagined I would be able to, um, but also not really being able to sit and write for long periods of time, which is pretty much what the dissertation required. And so I also had a moment of thinking I wasn't going to finish and not knowing what the future held. And it was my advisor who actually said, why don't you think about having, she at the time called it a tandem worker. So having somebody that would come and sit with you and then you can just dictate to them and try to finish up that way. And um, yeah, I, I think any of <laughs> is going through the dissertation process, it feels like insecure enough to sit by yourself and try to write it. So trying to externalize it to somebody was quite a process, but that is how I finished my dissertation. I would say the institution, you know, had a, a long um, process in terms of trying to get accommodations from the university. So I ended up paying for that out of pocket, which was not super easy as a graduate student, but was what kind of needed to happen to finish up. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think we'll unpack some of these other things, but I will say that the for me, the process of interviewing was I interviewed in a wheelchair at a time that I still didn't have a diagnosis. I didn't have any way of even deciding whether to disclose or not to disclose because I had no idea what was happening to my body. And so just kind of navigated people's assumptions. I know because one of my um, committee members later told me that they did get asked questions about my disability or potential disability during um, reference checks, which of course is not legal, but it did happen. And they you know, also told me how they responded to that and actually telling people that that was an inappropriate question to ask. So it kind of, I mean, I know some of the things that happened behind the scenes. Um, I will say that um, the journey kind of as a faculty member, there's a lot I think that Bonnie, you and I will unpack in this conversation. So I'll probably stop there. But the only other point I will add is as a junior faculty member, I had a significant concussion, which led to some vision related disability. So I will say like from my 20s through early 40s, you know, acquiring additional disabilities and kind of again and again, trying to recreate and reimagine kind of how I show up and what that means in terms of what I ask of institutions and others, at least at the personal level of being able to continue with the work that I do. Great. And then thank you both for your 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 vulnerability and, and sharing your your personal stories and, and narratives um, with us and, and, and with this community. Um, I just want to want to acknowledge that. Um, perhaps to get the conversation um, uh, section of, of our of our session going, um, I, I start with maybe a foundational question. And I know you each talked about um, some individual and personal barriers that you faced um, throughout academia, but how widely recognized or understood are barriers for, for people with disabilities in academia? And yeah, Bonnie, if you'd like to start. <laughs> yeah, this is Bonnie. I'll start and um, Rupa, please do uh, uh, chime in whenever. Um, not very well recognized, <laughs> you know, I'll be frank. Uh, you know, in my experience, um, there's been increasing recognition. And again, I think that was discussed a little bit, <laughs> excuse me, and the last panel, but we still have so far to go. Um, What's interesting to me is where I feel a lot of the recognition in academia has been happening is in undergrads. Um, again, 
we are far from being in a good place, but there's been more conversation and dialogue, but it falls off for graduate students, let alone postdocs and forget about it for faculty. We're, we're really far away um, for faculty and staff, I think. And a lot of the conversation is around accessibility and accommodations and, you know, that's important and, and always will be, but there's not enough conversation around addressing ableism and uh, ableism and policies and procedures, attitudes, discrimination, like Rupo is describing and things like hiring processes and decision making um, of, uh, you know, the words we use in writing letters, salary decisions, all of those things. We're not thinking enough about those inequities, those barriers for people with disabilities, um, things that we have thought to some degree about for, for other groups that are underrepresented. And we're certainly also not thinking about the, these barriers through a lens of intersectionality, right? So people with disabilities from other groups, how this is a compounding um, barrier for folks. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll echo. I, I absolutely agree that it's not widely understood. I think more than when I started, there is broadly more awareness in terms of the barriers individuals, you know, with disabilities that we as a disability community face kind of broadly, more broadly in society, nowhere near where we need it to be, but certainly more than when I started that at least it's a part of more conversations. Um, I will say that at least in some of the institutions, I see some progress in terms of trying to create some programming around this. Uh, but I think one of the challenges that really exists, at least in the institutions that I engage with, it's still very voluntary. So the people who show up are the people who probably are those that work with students and you know work with staff and, and faculty to try to um, meet them where they are. And because of the voluntary nature of that, it probably doesn't or you know, I know it doesn't reach and everyone it needs to reach in terms of moving forward. And I would also say just like another challenge is a, a general kind of compliance mentality. So even if we're thinking about meeting needs, it's about how do we meet our, our legal obligations often. Um, and some of the conversation may be more around that as opposed to thinking about barriers much more widely than just meeting those um, yeah, expectations in terms of uh, compliance. To, to build off of that and also what um, what Bonnie, what you mentioned with um, understanding ableism, um, I, I want to ask maybe what would you suggest um, to improve the understanding of barriers by uh, by our peers or by our institutional leaders? Um, what might you suggest um, we can do to, to, to start that conversation and, and to actually make that change? Maybe, yeah, maybe I'll start off, off and then Bonnie jump in. I mean, I think what we're doing today is a key part of what that looks like is sharing our experiences, expanding the conversation and continuing to expand it. So all of you who are here today in, in this conversation with us, if we all then go out and have additional conversations, some of this happens through sharing stories, sharing what we learn from, from each other and trying to bring more people into that conversation. I will say, for me, that's been a huge part of trying to move spaces forward is just bringing other people into the conversation and then they themselves can bring others into it. Um, the, the other thing that I have found in terms of improving understanding is when engaging with students, engaging with colleagues. Um, I know at the, at the end of the last session, I wasn't able to attend the whole session, but the end of the last session, this question about, you know, it's up to every each person to decide when and how much to disclose. But I do think when it is comfortable to disclose, was the disclosing with students and colleagues and um, having those conversations about how to make it work in a way that is more accessible, um, I think makes it less abstract, right? When you, you're kind of in that personal relationship. And so I have found that that has been another way um, to spread through networks, um, the, the need to think about accommodating. Can you pause there, Bonnie, if you want to jump in, some more thoughts, but. Yeah, you know, I feel like we're in so many spaces and in, in research out of still such a baseline understanding. Um, again, we've had great progress, but there needs to be 
like Rupa said, more conversation, more education, and oftentimes some unlearning about what people um, think about disability, think what about what people with disabilities can or cannot do. And, you know, I, I agree with Rupa, and it's um, been so important to have leaders in science um, increasingly with disabilities get to those positions, but also disclosing, right? Holden was just in the last session, clearly a leader in science. And when, you know, he wrote a beautiful editorial um, um, publicly disclosing, you know, the, the impact of that is is amazing and is is hard to even understand, but it had more people talking about you know, disability in science and recognizing it's an asset and and not a negative um, and just how valuable that is. And I realize there's a power differential or imbalance at earlier phases in, in research careers at a postdoc level. So I do think we need more leaders um, um, to to find ways to uh, be brave if and and hopefully there's more safe spaces. But I also think it takes leaders um, and faculty without disabilities to really get in this game. I've seen amazing change and traction come when people from outside the disability community are in faculty meetings or are in leadership meetings and are just starting to ask questions. They don't have to have solutions, but are just saying, what about disability in this effort? Or what about accessibility? Or are we thinking about this? And that is very powerful. Um, and it's not happening enough. I think that's really critical. The last thing is I do think we need to do a little bit of unpacking of this. It's a cycle of how this um, exclusion happens, right? We've got policies and decision-making um, rubrics that really do uh, squeeze people with disabilities out of academia and research settings that then leads to a lack of mentorship, that then leads to lower representation, that then leads to more ableism. And you know, really thinking carefully about where we can break that cycle and strategically about what actions can be made at different levels um, within research or the research enterprise to, to make that happen. So real concrete specific actions I think are, are still needed. And, and I wanna follow up on that um, with maybe a more specific question of what policies or processes um, often exist at institutions that may inhibit the inclusion of, of individuals with disabilities. Are there anything that you could point to in, in terms of processes, procedures, policies um, that are really um, uh, inhibiting inclusion? Uh, I mean, I'm happy to start out again and then jump in, Bonnie. Um, there's like so many things that we can unpack here. I mean, one of the things that I think is happens kind of across the board. We were talking about even starting with an interview process is waiting for somebody, right, a disabled person to ask for the accommodations they need. So not making this a part of something we ask everybody to begin with. You know, are there accommodations you need? Are there things that we can do to make your visit go smoother and to be right as welcoming for you and, and as easy for you as possible? So I think just right setting the expectation, setting that norm that we want to listen, we want to meet you know, your needs and you where you are can set the right tone and can, it's a cultural shift, right? We're not waiting for somebody to have to engage in self-advocacy. We as disabled people advocate for our, ourselves all the time. And so to have somebody ask that, you know, um, maybe as simple as that sounds, I think is, is actually really powerful. I do think I, I mentioned this idea of, you know, what training is optional, not optional. I think that's another like really important piece of policy. If we're talking about making, for example, um, classes accessible to disabled students, it shouldn't be optional for instructors to learn how to do that. Um, it should, and it also shouldn't be again, kind of individual accommodation based. And we, there may be additional accommodations that students need, but the right having captioning available while you're lecturing right, should be a norm, right? That doesn't need to be something that somebody has asked accommodations or using a microphone when you speak, right? There's things that we should train all of our instructors to do. And same for in terms of mentorship, right? How do you work with a student 
you may have won, you know, we've always done it this way, right? The mentorship style and learning strategies of how to do that. So again, I don't think these should be optional trainings. These should be you know, required for everyone to be both to, right, in terms of um, meeting right everyone's needs, but also then to serve, as Bonnie was saying, right, advocates moving forward in other spaces that they enter. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one more uh, and then turn it over to Bonnie, but I, I know a big issue can also be who pays for accommodations. So that has become, right, is, does that happen at your department level? Is that a researcher, like if you're a mentor for a postdoc with a disability, does it come out of your research budget? Does that happen at the centralized university? That's another really, you know, <laughs> big barrier in terms of whether or not it's, you know, explicitly stated, certainly, right, all of, like our incentive structures in academia around financial models and it matters. Yeah, this is Bonnie. Rupa, I'm so glad you brought that up. I, I, you know, this idea of moving to uh, what's called a centralized cost center to offset the costs of any um, accommodation request is, I think, an essential policy change that needs to happen that isn't happening enough in higher ed because of what Rupa just described. I mean, it's something I've experienced many times over in my career. The, the cost is often kicked down the road to your hiring unit or your manager or your dean. And, you know, what a power imbalance that is and, and what an inequity that is. And to pretend that doesn't play into hiring decisions is just ridiculous. You know, I, I also think that the way the policies that create um, inequities or barriers for, for people with disabilities are things like leave policies or um, um, if someone needs to take a, a period of absence, oftentimes that means you're going to lose your health insurance. So that's a double whammy on if you if you do or if you don't um, and, and an issue that's come up time and time again. Um, there's also, um, you know, the general publisher parish mentality, which I don't know if that's really a policy, but it's baked into our policies and this hustle culture that you know removes the focus on the impact that people have and instead of focusing on the output that we um, give, how many grants you have and how many papers you publish. And for many people with disabilities, you know, we do things differently and sometimes at different paces, but that doesn't mean our impact on science and on society is any less. Um, and I apologize if you hear my dog barking. Um, and I think there's also a barrier when there's just an absence of policy. Um, that can be a problem too. And Rupa just described that beautifully in hiring practices. You know, what, what um, I often say is to simply just always ask, how can we work with you best? Or how can, you know, your visit be um, the most welcoming? You don't even specifically have to ask about an accommodation, but have that language because you know, there's a variety of ways that you can meet people where they are are at and coming from in every situation with questions like that. And then the last I would say is so often in academia, we don't have really good um, recourse when things go wrong or a place to go. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, so our, our disability service um, uh, staff are amazing and work really hard but sometimes when that's not working well, the grievance process goes back to them and that's an inequity. And um, it, for faculty or even for postdocs, it can be a limbo of where your, where your grievance um, goes. And if that results in any change and how we can make sure that when you do report um, some kind of uh, discrimination or barrier that it's being handled seriously and um, from a neutral place and um, individuals are really protected. That's not that's not being thought about enough for, for people with disabilities. This, this conversation, it's, it's really, really insightful. Um, and you both mentioned um, this idea of stakeholders and, and folks who we um, want to join in the conversation. And I actually uh, have a message here in the chat um, that asks ask specifically, what offices, and, and again, both of you touched on this, but what offices within the academic structure are important to be involved in this process of, of shifting policy, um, shifting procedures to, to make things more accessible and inclusive? Uh, 
Um, this is Bonnie. I'll go, I'll go first and then uh, go, go to Rupa. Such a good question. And obviously it's going to depend a bit on what institution and, you know, if you're a decentralized academic structure or centralized structure. Um, I guess the short answer is all of them. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, but that's probably not a satisfactory answer. But, you know, I think that there's uh, policy changes that are needed in um, um, sort of the facilities in the construction office, right? All the way to disability services and institutional equity offices, all the way to the provost office and dean's offices. So it's hard for me to say, you know, just one, I really think all. Um, I think that sometimes the best structures are to have uh, in the so-called academic C-suite and leadership, you know, um, an advisor or a trusted um, 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 expert within within those conversations in the rooms where these decisions are being made to give that ex um, expertise and not in a tokenizing way, but in a really valued and meaningful way. That isn't happening often enough. But if you know there's one place to make impact, it's making sure disabled people are in those places where important policy decisions are being made. And that certainly also applies to academia. Um, so I always aim for the top and uh, see how far you can get and, and work your way from there. Yeah, I love that response. I'd written, uh, Logan, as you were speaking, top down and bottom up, right? I mean, let's try to do this in all the different ways we can. Sometimes um, the bottom up, right? If, it, if it's hard to start at the top, then you start from the bottom up and then those conversations, right? Then move up the chain. Um, I've had that experience here at the University of Virginia. And then I think when you can, of course, right? Bringing people in to those top leadership positions is essential to have those conversations. And so that from the top, there's a signal that this matters and that we expect, right? That others are going to um, follow suit and, and also be thinking explicitly about disability as a part of each of the conversations that are happening. The The other part, I, the only other thing I would add potentially is, um, I think it's really important for disabled people to be in those positions. I think in, in a lot of spaces historically that has not been true that the people who are leading some of the initiatives related to disability are not themselves disabled and i do think of course it's important to have allies and advocates from you know who are um engaging with our with our community in other ways that's absolutely essential but i think it's also essential for disabled people to be in those um in those leadership roles in terms of advocating as well Great. Th thanks for sharing that, Rupa. Yeah, in terms of having um, disabled folks represented, um, I, I want to maybe push that a, a bit further in terms of what might there, what other missing pieces or missing steps might be part of this process? A representation issue, um, you know, other kind of breakdowns. What are there any other things that uh, may be kind of inhibiting um, this, you know, push towards towards accessibility and inclusion? And did you want to start off? I felt like I started off for a few. So sure. you want to sure. jump in and then I'll jump in. Yeah. Yeah, this is Bonnie. I think, you know, we need an ecosystem change. Um, um and, and to uh understand the value and importance of of making sure people's disabilities are part of research, part of academia. Um, not just because it's nice, but because it's essential to do good science and to do good research. And so with that being said, I think it is important to drive change. We have to also look outside of academia. Think about our funders. What are our funders requiring and demanding to support a culture of disability inclusion and accessibility? Are they requiring that the grants be submitted in formats that are maximizing accessibility? Are there requirements about disability inclusion? Are, um, is there a focus on training um, uh, in, in efforts around diversifying the next generation? Is there an inclusion or a focus on people with disabilities? So to me, I think that's still, that's, we're getting, gaining some ground there, but that's external pressure is certainly needed to um, really drive change in higher ed. Um, and I, I hope it continues. I'll jump in. I don't know if you can all hear the noise in the background, so I'm I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Um, 
You sound great. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so good. I'm glad. Um, so I mean, Bonnie's building up your one point, you know, in terms of grants, for example, I think the other part of the, for funders and thinking about this, and this can be in terms of internal grants too, right? Universities also provide grants for research. You know, what is in the budget? Is there a budget for accommodations to bring on and disabled students as a part of, right back to this idea of who's funding the accommodations? So thinking through that, um, certainly at, you know, kind of level of, federal funding, there's things like administrative supplements, right? That could be made also for bringing accommodations and making the whole research process more accessible. So just thinking through, again, more broadly speaking, I think funding always, unfortunately, becomes a part of all of these conversations. So thinking through that um, more systematically is important. I do think part of it is, in, in all honesty, a lack of awareness in, in terms of just not thinking about disability and conversations about inclusion. I do think that is slowly changing, but I think it's a very slow change. I will say that in you know conversations, if I think institutionally that I've been a part of, for example, in our health system, um, the, the one example I like to give is during the pandemic when we had a group of us that came together the steering committee for the health system in terms of focusing on health equity and reaching our um, historically underserved populations, disability was not a part of the conversation until I brought it up. And once I brought it up, actually the health system mobilized a lot of resources. We worked with our community partners. We had clinic vaccination clinics that were focused specifically on um, meeting the needs of our disability community. And those needs were communicated by all of our community partners. So I, I think, there was mobilization once that conversation came up. And I, I felt like this has happened in multiple places. We we're talking about um, for our statues and monuments at, at the UVA as well. There was a committee that was about how do we make historical knowledge about these monuments and statues um, available, broadly speaking. And again, it's just because I'm in this space and somebody know, knows me, right, brought in and Rupa can help us think through making all of this accessible. So I, I think, again, generally, that probably wouldn't have come up in the conversation, except that, right, somebody was in the room who's had another conversation, um, which gets me to this idea of what I like to think of as a kind of a chain of mentorship. I know there's been so many barriers for so many of us for being in academia. And I think there's hopefully, right, as we dismantle barriers, there'll be more and more people coming up. So just thinking through how do we find structures um, to be able to mentor? I do think it was really hard to not have mentors in academia who've gone through the process and can help um, navigate some of this. So I've you know been wanting to think through more about how do we kind of mentor in broader groups um, for those of us who, who are able to, so faculty to mentor junior faculty, to mentor postdocs, and then for those of you who are postdocs or are going to be postdocs thinking about, you know, the undergraduate re um, potential researchers that you may be interacting with and encouraging them and showing them how to navigate, that's also a really important part of this process. Thank you, Ruba. And your your point, um, uh, it led to a question in the chat from Alberto. Um, and um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing the question here is how well do academic chief diversity offices um, include disability needs and goals within their portfolio? As you mentioned, um, you know, sometimes it takes an individual person um, to bring up disability in conversation. But kind of thinking more broadly, does a CDO office include disability in their needs? Yeah, that's such a great question. I, I don't think that's a universal answer, right, across the board. I think, again, it's, um, yeah, what conversations that person has been a part of and in terms of whether that gets brought in explicitly or not. Again, I, I, I can speak from the experience here, um, and this is more in the context in this part, in terms of our health system, for example, our um, a chief diversity officer in our health system, for example, I was able to meet with him early on and talk, talking about disability. And I know he has then advocated for thinking about disability in the context of a lot of conversations that have been happening in the health system. But I, I don't know that it would have been top of mind without those conversations, unfortunately. So again, I would like to think that, right, as we have these conversations, as kind of awareness expands, um, I would like to think we're moving in a direction where disability is more explicitly a part of these conversations about DEI and is a part of um, 
someone's framework who's in that office for thinking about what does it mean in terms of casting a net that's inclusive of the disability community when thinking about DEI related issues. Yeah, this is Bonnie. I think it's also important to not just consider if there's um, a consideration of disability in, in those offices, but if there's an appropriate allocation of resources. Mm -hmm. um, because what I have seen is a little bit of, uh, I don't know, I guess just uh, in name or in, in, in word only um, signaling support, but there's absolutely no programming or funding. And, and that's a concern. I also just have to say in this moment that, you know, as, as those efforts in general potentially might be um, continually uh, under threat, um, it's an interesting conversation that I've, I've had with, with lots of leaders across science and across academia mm -hmm. about, you know, the opportunity to shift, shift and to think about leading with disability. Um, it's a truly intersectional mm -hmm. experience. And, you know, when we're talking about the language we've used up towards now is a lot of equity language and there's plus and minus on changing language in response to the moment. But what we're really talking about is removing barriers to get to a more, um, a workforce that, that moves science forward at a pace that we really need it to, right? And when we're talking about removing barriers to include more people that have been held out, you know, it's um, sometimes easier to imagine people with disabilities as the example. Um, and it's it's an interesting conversation that I have mixed feelings about, to be honest, mm -hmm. but it will be, you know, I'm interested to see how it, it continues. Um, but I, 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 you know, it's a, it's it's sort of a change moment, right, on a lot of these conversations, and mm -hmm. we'll see where disability is. I was just at a on a panel discussion earlier this week where it's sort of like we're fighting for disability to be part of these diversity, mm -hmm. equity, and inclusion conversations, but at the same time, um, there's this potential push to lead with these, you know. So it's this bizarre um, shift that's happening. Yeah, funny. I, well, but, I yeah, I would you like to add? Like, yeah, sorry. Really like, I, no, no, I, I really appreciate, Bonnie, where you took the conversation. I want to circle back to one thing you said early on about pet resources. And just to think about, I think there's also um, often, I don't want to say necessarily an expectation, but perhaps an expectation for those of us who are in those spaces to do a lot of this as a volunteer effort, kind of on top of everything else. And so it's about resources to implement the projects that may come up or the initiatives that need to be implemented, but also resources to support time. Um, back to, right, most of us who are, who are kind of taking on these roles, whether you're in a postdoc position and you're right trying to work with other undergraduate students or you're a faculty position and, and you're uh, doing some of this advocacy work and mentoring work, a, a lot of that relies on taking on something extra. Um, and, and that can also be you know, and quite honestly burdensome, right? And not because you don't want to do the work, but because, right, many of us are managing multiple things um, in addition to and like working in, um, yeah, kind of with a different relationship to time and, and, and pace. So thinking about that as well, what does it mean to take on this extra work and how do we create space and resources to do that? Um, speak, speaking of that, I know you you each do phenomenal work in 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 this area, and I I, I want to make sure that that's acknowledged. And I do want to ask what um what kind of progress is being made, or kind of ongoing work is is going on that you would like to to share, or, or, or things that might be relevant um to this community and to this conversation that um you know in, in kind of a, a positive light is is kind of addressing some of these inequities. Bonnie, do you want to start talking about some of the I'm like NASM work? I don't know. That might be a yeah, nice place sure. to start and then build from. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess I'll first say, um, you know, last year NIH uh, designated people with disabilities as a health disparity population, which has an impact on the research NIH supports, but also the workforce. So that designation um, in 2023 uh open the door for including people with disabilities in um, funding efforts around diversifying the workforce in ways that weren't possible before. There was some efforts, but it wasn't as robust as it's 
moving forward now. And then, yes, uh, Logan and Rupa, among others on this call, had the we all had the um, honor and privilege of being on a National Academies workshop um, focused on um, dismantling ableism and advancing STEM that was supported by the National Science Foundation. And um, for those that are following along, it's led to a consensus study that's being, um, I think the committee is being selected for right now. Um, and for those that don't, you know, the National Academies is a complicated structure, but that's a big deal uh, to get to a consensus study that um, academics and Congress and um, lots of professional organizations pay attention to. Um, and just because uh, Holden, who's part of uh, AAAS, was on before, uh, AAAS is now has a multidisciplinary working group focused on um, addressing ableism and promoting disability inclusion across STEM. Um, AAAS is a powerful professional organization in, in science. And the idea of that is to um, provide advice on to how to leverage the power of AAAS to address and, and move forward these issues. And of course, this conversation, right? Rip, I'm sure you've got a lot more to add there. All right, I mean, I think those are, yeah, fabulous examples. And and, and I think that, I mean, I like you're giving examples in, in those you know, three spaces. I think that is happening in a lot of other spaces as well, kind of simultaneously. And they're kind of like a positive, right? Reinforcing loop that as more, um, institutions and organizations explicitly acknowledge that we need to be focusing on disability inclusion, right? That brings yet more people into the conversation, which leads to more um, organizations making a formal commitment to doing that. And so I do think in, in terms of what is a positive that we're seeing uh, that change that I think like with, we are on the cusp of for so long. So if we like the word tipping point, right? We're at that point where now there is um, forward momentum in making this happen. And, um, right, hopefully that continues in light of in light of other changes that are happening. And Katie does ask in the chat, does anyone know if there's anything that we can do um, as a postdoc community here to support the, the NASM efforts or other ongoing efforts that are happening? And it looks like Melissa put the <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I saw something in the <laughs> chat, yeah. The chat. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is funny. I was going to say, I think the, the experts, mm -hmm. the academies are <laughs> can probably answer that great mm -hmm. question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah those are, um, yeah, three different resources there that I think mm -hmm. uh, could be really helpful to direct folks um, and, 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 and go from there. Um, there's also a question. So in their remaining time here, you know, considering that we, we have our, our postdoc community uh, specifically here, um, two questions um, somewhat related, uh, but thinking about um, the responsibility of what it means to be a postdoc, um, whether or in grad students, but students and employees. Um, so this question here is uh, grad students are sometimes uh, and postdocs can kind of fall uh, fall you know, out, out, out of place um, kind of in this role. I know as a graduate student, I often felt that way, you know, you're wearing multiple hats and kind of different responsibilities lie in different places. Um, but do you have suggestions for how to better harmonize institutional support uh, for trainees kind of in this limo uh, space? Yeah, this is Bonnie. This is such a great question. I'll be honest, I don't have a fantastic answer, but I think, you know, this collective group could um, probably organize a bit around that, for, particularly as it applies to uh, postdocs with disabilities and the unique barriers that that gray zone presents. Um, it, it you're, I mean, this is such a spot on question that's, that's um, has implications for so many postdocs. You're in this limbo. Um, but yes, it, it certainly has particular implications for where you're seeking accommodations within an institution or you know where that cost center is for supplying the the funding for the accommodations and oftentimes it's really not been thought through there isn't a roadmap um postdocs with disabilities are falling through the cracks on this issue and i think it's really a a change opportunity yeah i absolutely echo that i think there's such an opportunity to come together and support each other and to bring on, right, and for people who don't identify as disabled, right, both people who are 
disabled and allies to come together and support each other to advocate together. And I think this is we're in a space of so much mutual learning about how to do this work well. And that's part of right. the community is important to support each other through your individual journeys, but to then share lessons, right? Because some institutions will be more willing and open to making changes. And then the other institutions who are, you know, maybe not quite there yet, it's helpful for them potentially to have a model and say, okay, these other institutions are doing this work. Here's how they're doing it. And to be able to then spread that. So I think that's really important. And I think then that community also, I mean, your postdoc is, you know, for a couple of years. And so then, right, moving into a faculty position, creating those strong networks, like, then allows you to navigate the challenges of being early career faculty together as well, or right in industry, depending on where you're going. Um, so I, I think there's just a lot in terms of community building and mutual learning that can happen. Yeah. And I know we are getting uh, close to, to time here. I, I do want to ask kind of in, in closing, maybe, um, you know, in terms of your final remarks, maybe what what um, what advice or what um, yeah, what do you what would you like to share? You know, with this with our community of postdocs here, um, in terms of kind of what folks can do individually and, and kind of you know help to to kind of envision what could be a, a more um, accessible and inclusive uh, academic environment for individuals with disabilities. I might I might start by just saying you know, reaching out to each other, reaching out to, I mean, honestly, to us, I, I think so much of this happens through learning. I, I, when I think back to, you know, this question of like, that, I was like, tell me about like your career journey, right, that everybody gets asked at some point in time by right, someone. I, I feel like I am here because of an incredible community. Um, when I started my faculty position, I had no idea how to advocate for myself. I, to be quite honest, I didn't even know what my rights were. Um, I didn't know what those first few years were going to look like. And I remember, you know, a few things. One was um, this, uh, this uh, strange story I sometimes tell about how my sister worked with um, Judy Human at State Department and I had no idea who Judy was at the time. And, um, and long story short, my sister was like, hey, do you want to meet with her? And just, and, and you know, the, she opened up this community for me in, in certain ways, right? And, and I met so many people who I could learn from and learn how to navigate, how to advocate for myself, what my rights were. And then the local community department chair connected me to a group here at UVA. And that was huge in terms of, again, learning. Um, because I, I felt like I knew nothing about how to navigate this. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to build community now and, and to like amongst each other, but then, right, to, I mean, there are those of us who, who've gone through this before. I know I learned so much from the people who went before me. So that's, that's the one thing I would say is just build those relationships because they get you through a lot and we can learn from each other and you know push the stru structural changes forward together. Yeah, this is Bonnie. I fully agree. Community is everything and find it within your institution or outside your institution or outside academia, um, whatever, wherever uh, you can to remind you that you belong. You belong here. You should be here. Um, yeah, hearing her, but it's, it's uh, talk about Judy. Uh, we've wrote, worked on a paper and right before she passed, she gave us good feedback and so uh that paper was about structural ableism <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's a, a good way to remember how important the power of having strong mentorship and community mm -hmm. is across the arc of your career and how those individuals just keep pushing you along great and, and really, thank you both for such a wonderful conversation. I appreciate just how um, how genuine and, and, and vulnerable um, you all were able to be kind of in this conversation and sharing of your your wisdom, your expertise, your personal experiences um, through through navigating this. So I know we're at time here. I do uh, want to, again, really, really thank you again um, for, for participating here as our panelists. I also want to acknowledge that there are several um, resources pasted in the chat that um, 
that I think can be really helpful in, in continuing and in, in driving this conversation as well. Um, and Tom um, just shared um, many resources that the, the uh, National Postdoc Association has as well. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, just want to, to say thank you again, and I'll hand it back to Tom for our uh, next session. Thank you so much, Logan, and to the panelists. That was just phenomenal and how we journeyed in that hour from the need for institutional change and understanding the barriers to, all the way to self-advocacy and, and personal, uh, how individually you can make a difference and make change uh, in your environment. So thank you for that. And thank you, Logan, for moderating another session. For those of you who are with us, uh, just stay tuned. We'll be uh, starting up our third panel in just a few minutes. No need to jump off the Zoom. You can just stay on uh, to same uh, same Zoom link. We'll be on in just a few minutes with our, our third panel talking about um, uh, as we move out of out of barriers and towards pathways forward.